This may take an extra little bit this morning because it isn't Greg Cox up here. And the other thing is, I got to read his writing. <laughs> and with these bifocals, we may all be in trouble. Anyhow, let's get going. Welcome, y'all, and it's good to see y'all here this morning in this weather. Thank you, God, for bringing us this beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day weather. Okay, let's get going. Willie Waldrop passed away, and we want to keep him in our prayers, and we want to keep Don and Linda in our prayers also. Uh, Jean Smith's sister, Patty, passed away in Hobart, and we want to keep that whole family in our prayers. Bo Chancellor, Richard and Cheryl Lively, and Louise Taylor, a little under the weather this week, in addition to the bulletin, I understand that Bo was in the local hospital Thursday evening because his blood sugar got a little bit out of kilter. So we got to keep all those in our prayers. And of course, the people in the nursing home, Floyd and Joanne, Betty McNeil, Marie Phelps, and Marguerite Smith. When speaking in nursing homes, we need to keep the staffs in those nursing homes for the super jobs that they perform day in and day out. Um, next Wednesday evening at dinner, um, our main cook is taken off for making those delicious meals that she makes, and we're going to have potluck, so that means everybody bring what you want. It's a wonderful time of fellowship, and we sure like to see all of you there. Now another family matter. The family of Bill are having a retirement party next Sunday, October 10th, at 2 p.m. at the First National Bank Hospitality Room. Everybody, and that means everybody, is attended. I just got word as we came in that Marie de McKee's not doing real well. But with Ronnie taking care of her, I'm sure she'll pull through real good. I also have a few cards to read. And these will be given to Zonell, and she will put them in the bulletin. Dear church family, words cannot express my thankfulness to all of you for your prayers, texts, phone calls, and all the lots of kindness you have shown to Richard and I. I am truly blessed by each and every one of you. Thank you all. Love, Richard and Cheryl. We also have another one. To all our Christian family at Northside, thank you so much for thinking of us at the loss of our Brother Willie. Don and Linda Waldrop. Now, did I get everything, Greg? Right. Yeah, I got that one. <laughs> Don't forget, next Sunday, that retirement party. And old Bill is... I know he's looking forward to all of us being there. Is there any other announcements? We're going to hold on a second because here comes my girl uh, Louise. Morning, Louisa. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Our most gracious and heavenly loving Father, we come to you this morning, this beautiful, beautiful day that you have given us, Father, to 
give you thanks for the many, many, many blessings that you bestow upon each and every one of us. Father, the word thanks is not enough for what you do. Father, as we start out this new week, may we take a few extra moments to look to you for your guidance, Father, and for the love that you give us. Father, as we go through the week, may we let your light shine upon us that others may see you in us and hopefully come to you. Father, at this time I ask a special prayer for our sister Nell and for this beautiful United States of America. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Before we pray, I want to mention Ben being back, and we're glad he's back. I haven't seen him in a long time with all that wheat cutting and corn cutting and whatever else. So, Ben, we're glad to have you here. And Joyce also didn't get a good report this week on her uh, uh, what's going on in her blood. Still some uh, infection there, and uh, so she has to go back tomorrow, and they reassess things for her, and she still has the port in. So we want to remember her in a special way this morning, too. So let's, let's bow. 
Our Father in heaven, we know that you are holy. We proclaim your holiness and the holiness of your Son, the holiness of your Spirit, your perfection, your righteousness, your sinlessness. And we're so thankful that you're also such a mighty God of love. And we're also thankful that you can do anything and that you never stop seeing and you never stop hearing and you never stop caring about all of us. And we thank you that through your Son, that whom you sent, that you have saved us and we can call ourselves your children and we can do that without hesitation. We can do it even with boldness. And yet all the while we know that we still sin and we know that we still have difficulties in this life of our own making and, and we are thankful that you keep forgiving us. So we want to honor you. We want to praise you. We thank you for sustaining us, protecting us. And this morning as we come together, we want to proclaim all of that to you over and over again of how great you are and how much we need you. And we're asking this morning that you would look on us with particular kindness. There have been several who have been mentioned who have lost loved ones, and we pray for comfort. And we pray that you would help the ones who remain to navigate all the changes that occur. We pray for Joyce and what she is dealing with, with this infection. We pray, Father, that the doctors will figure out a way to end this and, and have her have complete health back. We pray for Marita that you'll help her as she continues to have a long struggle with health issues. We pray for Bo as he is fighting this diabetes problem. And we're thankful that Steve is able to retire from his job, and we pray, Father, that you give him a blessed future. And we pray, Father, for uh, our nation this morning. And the division is great. The agendas are many. And so much of it, Father, seems so wrong to some of us. And we pray, Father, that you would raise up people of strength and people of courage and people of values and people of character who could... Uh, who could keep us what you've always wanted us to be and what the founders intended for us to be. And pray that you'll bless us, that we might be a nation that calls upon you as the only God and that we seek you, Father, as the one who can help and change and save us. And so we pray for our nation, Father, and we don't know what to pray exactly. We don't know what specifically to pray. We just pray for your intervention and your help. Pray that you'll bless our time this morning together, that it'll be an encouragement to everyone. It'll be a, a time of blessing, and, and uh, it'll, it'll help us to keep up this fight against Satan and his kingdom and his world and his people. And, and Father, we pray this by the name of your Son, and we know the name of your Son means something to you, and we know it's the greatest name on the face of this earth, and he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and it's through him that we have access to you, and so we pray through him. Amen.
mentioned before that the latter part of the book of Acts, the last several chapters, seem to me at least to be written a bit differently than the first 17 chapters or 18 chapters. The latter part of the book of Acts is almost like Luke is writing in a journal and he's recording the events of the day, the travels, the people they meet, the difficulties they encounter. And so finding lessons in the latter part of the book of Acts is more difficult than finding those in the first part of the book of Acts. And yet I've been going through looking at various things that I think are valuable to us and important to us, and I'm finding some of those things. And some of them, you can make a couple of points in a lesson, some of them only one point. And this morning is a one-point lesson, and that's my favorite because it's difficult for me to remember any more than one point. And maybe it's just my age, or maybe it's just the way people are. I'm not sure. So I'm glad all of you are here. I, uh, I hope, as I said in the prayer, that you are blessed and encouraged by it. One thing I forgot to mention is that Gideon had a hit on the head or some crash in football. I'm not too much on football. I see too many injuries with it, but he's got a concussion. And so he's going to be out of the game for a little while here, but uh, we want to remember Gideon also. Today's his birthday? Wow, Gideon, you got a concussion and a birthday all at one time. That's, that's a, that's a. As you get to chapter 21 of the book of Acts, we know that Paul is, what it seems to be at least, in a hurry to get to Jerusalem. Right before he gets to Jerusalem, he will stop in a city called Caesarea. And Luke, writing this, tells us, upon the instruction of God, that that, that's where Philip lives. Now that's interesting, because Philip, we were introduced to in Acts chapter 6. He was one of the seven who was full of the Holy Spirit, and he is the one who is helping administer the food to those widows of that day. He's also the same Philip of Acts chapter 8 who went to a city in Samaria and spoke to the people there, the continuing story of Jesus. He's also the one who was called to speak to a man from Ethiopia. And now Luke tells us that he's living here in the city of Caesarea. And Luke says that he has four daughters, all of whom prophesy. Now, if you're wondering what it means to prophesy, you just continue to read this in chapter 21, and Luke Burke will have it on the screen. Because also in the city of Caesarea, along with the four daughters of Philip and maybe some others, there's a man named Agabus, and Agabus prophesies. His prophecy is an interesting prophecy because he comes up to Paul, apparently with a group of people, And if you're reading, you'll find that he takes Paul's own belt and he binds up his hands and binds up his feet and says something like this. If you go to Jerusalem, the Jews of Jerusalem are going to take you and bind you just like this and hand you over to the Gentiles. Now, anyone in that crowd would have understood what that meant. Though it was many years prior to this, they still understood that the same thing happened to Jesus in Jerusalem. The Jews took him and bound him and handed him over to the Gentiles, Romans. And Jesus was killed. And so those who were there hearing that, because of their great concern for Paul, began to plead with him not to go. Would that not be the same reaction you would have with someone that you cared deeply about. If you knew they were going over and likely be bound up and likely be put in prison, would you not say, please, please don't go? We would all do that. That's what they're doing. But Paul will speak to them like this. Why are you weeping? Do you see their intensity? You see their love? Why are you weeping? And at the same time, breaking my heart. I'm not only ready to go to Jerusalem to be bound, I'm ready to die for the name of Jesus. Now, here's the thought, the one point that I take from that. I was struck with the word commitment. I have... uh, 
I've never, that I can remember, taught any kind of lesson on commitment. And all these years, I can't remember. Maybe I did. Maybe I mentioned it sometime or another. But I don't remember it. I even had to look up the definition of commitment to show you how little I really know about it. And it says that it's a pledge or a promise that I will conduct myself in a certain way in the future. It's a pledge or a promise that I will act in a certain way into the future. Now, if you go back many years earlier, you would be in Acts chapter 9. And Paul is a young man back then. But he is a Pharisee, and he is zealous, and he's enthusiastic, and he is one who is one of these Jews binding up members of the body of Christ and imprisoning them, and in some cases, leading them to their death. And on the road to Damascus to do that very thing, he sees that light brighter than a noonday sun, He ends up in the city of Damascus, and finally a man named Ananias will touch his eyes, and he receives his sight, and he hears these kind of words. You're going to be one who continues to tell the story of Jesus, the same Jesus whom you have seen and now you've heard. And you're going to talk to the Jews, and you're going to talk to the Gentiles about the story of Jesus. But that person talking to Paul in Acts chapter 9 adds one thing. You're going to be shown, Paul, what you must suffer for this mission. Now, I don't know what went through Paul's mind about the word suffer. I know I don't like it, and you don't like it. But he makes a commitment to tell the story of Jesus, even though he knows it will involve much suffering. And I know he makes that commitment because he hears that, and immediately is baptized, he enters the kingdom, and he begins to preach like that. A commitment is a pledge or a promise that you make to conduct yourself in a certain way in the future. One of my favorite stories was told by Ronald Reagan in his first inaugural address. I loved Ronald Reagan. I liked how classy he was. I liked how strong he was. I liked what he accomplished with Russia and other things. I don't think any of us would have ever known this story had he not brought it out of the pages of history about a man named Martin Trepto. In 1917, Martin Trepto was a barber in a small town in Iowa. He decided to enlist in the army and soon found himself on the western front of battle in France. At one point, under heavy enemy fire, he was asked to carry a message from his group to another group. I don't know what those groups are called exactly. Some of you would know. Sure enough, as he was carrying the message, he was struck by a German machine gun fire and was killed. When they went through Martin Trepto's personal things, they found a diary. Now, he died in July of 1918. But on January the 1st of 1918, he had made an entry into this diary under the heading, My Pledge. Martin Trepto said, My Pledge. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work. I will save. I will sacrifice. I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depends upon me alone. He had written that a little more than six months prior to his death. He's making a pledge, a commitment that cost him his life. And I find myself this week thinking about commitment and and what it means. And and I find myself wondering about my own personal commitment to things. How committed am I? And you know what? I don't know the answer to that. Because here's what I'm seeing. The size of one's commitment, the intensity, the depth of it, 
is determined by the size of the obstacle that you encounter in life. See, I don't think we ever know about what our real commitment is until we face the big obstacles in life. I guess the easiest commitment for us to understand is the commitment of marriage. If you've ever been married, then you know that you have stood before someone who's called an official, and they have gone through some kind of ceremony. And I know that ceremonies vary greatly from one to another, but somewhere in that ceremony, this was said. Do you promise to take this person to be your husband or wife, whichever the case would be, and do you promise to love them, to take care of them, regardless of what circumstances may occur, so long as you both shall live? And if you finish that ceremony, you had to say, I promise, I do, I will, something like that. So you make a commitment. I heard this story a few months ago, and I don't remember where I heard it. Maybe it was on a focus on a family presentation, or maybe it was Chuck Swindoll presentation, I'm not sure. True story. Names are not given. But a young man, a young woman get married. They're enjoying married life, but there's an accident. She's in a car accident, and she's left paralyzed. And the man telling the story, the husband in this partnership, said, I was encouraged by several to get out of the marriage because it's not the kind of marriage I had thought I was going to have. But he said, I didn't get out of the marriage. I remembered I made a promise that I would stay with her regardless. They went on to have four children. He described it as a happy life. But it was not a normal marriage. It had all kinds of difficulties that other marriages do not have. But he said, I made a commitment to it. And I stayed with the commitment. You will never know the size of your commitment until you see the size of the obstacle. And I thought about commitment even my commitment to God. And I've wondered. Because sometimes I've had this tendency to measure my commitment by t- attending church. And sometimes I've had this tendency to measure my commitment by how much money I give. And though those things be important, do you realize how incredibly easy those things are to do? It's when you face real obstacles that you begin to understand the strength or the depth or the size of your commitment. So last Tuesday, Susan and I were in Lubbock. I visited with a man at a coffee shop there named David. Susan had visited with his wife, Tanya, the day before on Monday. As I visited with David, his eyes were misty. They are the ones whose daughter, 18 months ago, was going down a slide in a backyard I've told you about, and she was going down head first, about to enter her senior year of high school, and bumped her head against the side of the pool and was left paralyzed from the neck down. And David said, Ken, it's so hard. It's so hard. David and Tanya are both faculty members at Lubbock Christian. David is the dean of our school of education. He said, my marriage is so stressed. He said, we have no energy left for each other. We can't even carry on a decent conversation with each other. We're so numb. Their daughter's a freshman at Lubbock Christian, and they've done all kinds of things to make it work for the university and them. He said, though we have three caretakers that come in in a 24-hour period, we're still on call 
basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And while we're there talking like this, he said, now here's a text from Brooklyn, and she needs suction. He said, it's hard. It's hard. But he said, we're not going to give up. Our marriage is not going to fail. And we know God's working all the way through this because he said, we were up there at Denver in that hospital, and, and members of our congregation came in and totally remodeled our house, made everything handicap accessible. No cost to us whatsoever. And he said, then they come up and they buy us this new minivan that's handicap accessible, no cost to us. And we feel the prayers over and over again. We will endure. But it's hard. And I, I kept thinking as he was talking to me, the size of our commitment is determined by the size of the struggle that you and I end up facing in this life. The best example in the Old Testament and the most definitive for all of us, and you cannot miss what he's about to say, is found in a character named Job. And I have for a long, long time found Job to be mysterious in so many ways, but fascinating in so many ways also. Because here's what God says about Job. If you can imagine this, God says about Job, I don't have anybody else like him on the face of the earth. He, there's nobody like him. Now here's what Satan says to God. I've been going all across this earth looking for people whom I can devour. And you've taken this Job and you've blessed him. You've given him this huge family. You've given him all this wealth. Why wouldn't he be loyal to you? But Satan says, here's how it's going to work. If you will strike Job, if you allow me to strike Job, like all the other people, I'll tell you, he'll be just like everybody else. He will curse you. And God said, go ahead. Try it. Before you can even get very far in the first chapter of the book of Job, all his wealth is gone. Every single thing is gone. And his sons I mean, and daughters and their spouses, his entire family, gone, just like that. Except for his wife. I won't, shouldn't say it, but it'd probably be better if he had lost his wife and not his kids, as the story goes, if you read the full story. But that shouldn't have been said, so just race that, Burke. Don't, 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 let, don't let it get out. In addition to all that, he loses his health. He's miserably in pain. It's just, it's horrible. Satan says that's when he'll give up. That's when he'll curse you. You want to know what Job said? Now, Job didn't handle everything perfectly as you make your way through the book, but you want know what he said at that point? I didn't come into this world with anything, and I know I'm not going to go out of this world with anything. Praise be to God. I, can you imagine hardship to that level? Health, Family, wealth, everything that we value, gone. But I'll stick with God. Do you wonder about the size of your commitment? I've told you before about that one image. I really don't get this image out of my mind very far. And once in a while on television, I'll see it repeated. I hope I never lose a sight of men in orange jumpsuits on their knees, with their hands tied behind their back, with their heads bowed, called Christians. They're Christians. And the ISIS terrorist swordman is right there to lop off their heads. And apparently they can say, I give up on Jesus, and they might get out of this. But they don't do that. They stay right there without whimper and have their heads severed from their body. See, I don't know what I would do. I don't know if you tied my hands behind my back and put me on my knees and had a shiny sword lifted high over my head 
I don't know what I would do. Because you never know the size of your commitment until you face a sizable obstacle. So what am I supposed to do? So I, I don't know. What am I supposed to do? Well, I have this one thought. Commitment is so very important. And I know there are circumstances that arise that I, I can't figure out and commitments change. I understand all that. But in general, you understand what I'm trying to say this morning. Here's what I've decided. It would be good for us, likely, if each of us would add into our prayer life frequently that God would help us, regardless of what faces us in this life, to stand. That He would give us the strength, the resolve of a Martin Trepto. I will work, I will fight, I will sacrifice, I'll do it cheerfully, I will endure. We've got to win this war. And he gives up his life. And people are begging Paul, saying, don't, don't go to Jerusalem. You're going to... He said, I made him a commitment. If I go to Jerusalem, they bind me. Even if they kill me, I'm going to do it. That's commitment. That we and I would pray frequently. I'm not going to say every day. That's unrealistic. But frequently. That God would give us the resolve, the strength, the stand. When the obstacles get so large, we don't think we can stand. Now, can you guess the greatest commitment ever made? We're going to take the Lord's Supper. And we're going to remember Jesus. And Jesus from heaven made a commitment, I will go there and I'll show myself as a man and I will endure what people endure, only I will be killed on a cross so that those people can be saved. That's his commitment. And I'll tell you, when it got right down to it, when the, when the, when the event was at hand, when the cross was so very near, he's on his knees. And you know what he's asking God? I want out of this. My desire is not to have him nail me to a cross. But I made a commitment. It's your will. It's your way. If there's another way to do this, I'll be all for it. But it's your will. It's your way. And he died. And that's why we're here this morning. That's why we're here. Because he died and he was raised in the grave. And that's what we remember. So let's take those emblems remembering his commitment to us, what he did. And let's think about the size of our commitment in every area of life and how it's really determined and how you really don't know. You really don't know. You can say it all day long. I will do this. I'll do that. I, I've heard people do this all my life. I'll do this. I'll do that. But when it gets right down to it, sometimes it's harder than what we thought, isn't it? Things get so tough in this life. I know I need God's help. Jesus is the testimony of God's help. So let's remember that as we take these emblems. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I made a trip to uh, Tennessee and Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, it was for a welcome home veterans celebration. And we got to speak to a lot of veterans there and there were a lot of impressive memorials uh, to the Korean memorial and then there was the replica of the Vietnam Wall and if you haven't seen that if you haven't seen the real thing or even the replica it's pretty humbling all the sacrifices that were made there for us and um, then a friend actually sent this to my wife this morning, and I thought I'd share it with you. I once met a Vietnam veteran I'll call George. He told me about holding his dying friend in his arms while waiting for the rescue hop helicopter to take the wounded from the battle they were fighting. The first helicopter arrived. It was shot down while landing. The second one arrived a couple of minutes later. It too was shot down while hovering, trying to get the wounded. 
The third one arrived shortly after that, but for George's friend, it was too late. In telling the story, George wasn't complaining or bemoaning the fact that the rescue choppers had failed to get his friend and others out in time. Rather, his focus was on the bravery, courage, and determination of the chopper pilots not to give up, to leave no one behind. Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, yours and mine, was a tremendous sacrifice. It was Jesus' single most important act of courage in an effort to leave no human behind. Jesus has paid the ultimate price so we wouldn't have to. He has overcome it all. Every worry, heartache, uncertainty, betrayal, and failure. Whatever cares we have, we can cast on Him. He is our ultimate rescue. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to you this morning thanking you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that we have the opportunity to have our sins forgiven because of the sacrifice he gave for us. He is our ultimate rescue. And as we take this bread this morning, we ask that we remember each and every day what He has done for us. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. God, we again thank you for the opportunity to be here and to be around this table and to take this fruit of the vine which represents Jesus' blood that was spilled on that cross. And we know that his blood continually cleanses us and that we as a sinful people need this each and every day. We are so thankful that he did this for us. And so we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Should never be made lightly, but I also know that commitments are a constant part of life. We are constantly making commitments in various areas of our lives. However, the most important commitment any of us ever make will be the commitment to Jesus Christ, be a part of his kingdom. So we want to assist you in making that commitment. And from time to time, there are people who will say, I've kind, of, I've kind of missed out on my commitment. I've, I've not been as committed as I should be. And they want to redo that. And sometimes they need help. They need prayers. And we, we close our services uh, with a song. We call it an invitation song. And that's all tradition. That's not in the Bible. But it's a convenient time for people to do things like make that commitment or a recommitment or whatever it might be. So we want to do that this morning. Let's stand and sing. When we Father, once again, we come to you in prayer, acknowledging that you are the creator of all things and the seasons that you give us in this beautiful morning that we have to come to service and sing songs of praise and listen to your word. And Father, as we go through this week, we ask that you will help us to do what is right 
to live our lives according to the word that you have taught us. And Father, we know that there are those that are hurting with illness, those that have lost loved ones. We ask that you be with each of them and their families, that you can give them comfort and strength. Father, once again, we're mindful of our nation and the concerns that many have. We ask that you be with the leaders, that you might intervene to help them make the right decisions. And Father, we're also mindful of our men and women in the armed services. We ask that you keep them safe, bring them back to their families. And Father, as we live our lives, we know that things come up that are hard, that we struggle with, and we sin, and we ask that you forgive us. And Father, we know that sometimes we forget that you are in control and that you know everything that is going on and the decisions that will be made before they are made. And Father, help us to have a stronger commitment, as Ken has talked about this morning, that when those obstacles do come up, that we can stand firm and stand strong. Father, be with us as we leave this morning. We thank you for this day, for our lives, for our families, for our friends, for everything that you have given us. But most importantly, we thank you for your son who died on that cross for our sins, and it is through his grace and his mercy and love that we might have eternal life. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.